a big step forward for IBMQ. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Bob Suter, Vice President, IBM Research for IBMQ Ecosystem Development. Welcome back, Bob. Hi, Tanya. Glad to be back. So welcome back. Um, just give us a refresher. What is the mission of IBMQ? So IBMQ, it's the quantum computing program at IBM Research. And really, um, there's one mission, and that is to make quantum computers better for some applications than classical computers. Uh, there are some things, no matter how big they get, how much memory um, they will eventually have, that classical computers just will never be able to do. So something we call class, excuse me, something that we call quantum advantage is a situation where a quantum computer can solve a problem, a real practical problem that a classical computer just can't do. So our goal is quantum advantage. IBM has a big announcement to make today. Tell us about the new Quantum Computation Center. Sure, let, let me give you some numbers to, to kind of tell you why we're doing what we're doing today. Uh, we introduced the first quantum computers on the planet three and a half years ago. Since then, we've had over 150,000 registered users. We've had 200 scientific papers that have been written using this. We've had over 240,000 downloads of our open source, open source software development kit. It would seem like it's a good idea to add some more computers. <laughs> so we've, we've had a handful available for, um, for open use as well as premier use. So what we're announcing is that um, as of, of today, uh, we are going to have a fleet of 10 quantum computers available. So real hardware, nothing just simulated, real hardware. And about half of those will be in our Poughkeepsie data center. Now Poughkeepsie, uh, for those of you who don't know New York State, um, is uh, where Vassar College is. Some people may know, know because of that. It's about 50 miles north of New York City. And in fact, it's the home of the IBM mainframe going back to the 1960s. So it's very appropriate that we have this new quantum computation center there. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, so we'll, we'll have 10 up and running right now. In the next month, though, we're going to be adding four additional machines, and one of them is a 53-qubit quantum computer. So this is the largest computer that we have ever created, and we will be making it available for our premier users via the cloud. Wow. So one of them you mentioned is at 53, which is, is, is pretty significant. Tell us mm -hmm. about the other quantum computers. How many qubits? Um, what kind of quantum volumes are we talking about? So, so um, to refresh, um, quantum volume is, is a single metric that we can use to, to state how powerful a machine is. Um, only looking at the number of qubits is, is not really sufficient because, look, I could have 50, really great qubits. You might have 500 qubits, but unfortunately, Tanya, you have really bad qubits. They have a lot of errors. They're just not working well. They're not playing nicely with others. I'm sorry. Um, if I'd been a little bit more astute, I would have reversed that, but be that as it may, I win with my 50 great qubits. There are a lot of factors that go into making a working quantum computing system. So yes, the number of qubits, because algorithms require a certain number of qubits. But are the qubits doing what you want them to do? So when you begin with a qubit, you have to initialize it to zero. Well, are you initializing it to zero or are you initializing it to something sort of close to zero? If it's not exactly zero, you're going to have a problem. Now, these are different devices, remember. They're not the digital devices that we have in our, our laptops and our phones and things like that. So there's the initialization error. Then we do a whole lot of computations, right? Which I'll return to in a moment. And at the end, you force it to become either a zero or one, again, based on, on what its state is. Are you measuring it correctly? Is it really a zero, but are you measuring it as a one? Are you 99% correct most of the time, right? And things like this. And then in the middle, when you're working with the, with the qubits themselves, when you tell the qubits, well, perform this operation. So classically analogy is to say, add two plus three. Am I really getting five or am I getting 4.8? Am 
Am I getting uh, 5.7? Am I getting whatever? So the operations that we perform on the qubits have uh, a certain fidelity, right? Are they really doing what we say they should do? All sorts of other places that noise can kind of enter into the system, quantum mechanical effects, um, entanglement that we don't expect. So the goal is to build these systems which, which operate as precisely as possible with as little noise as possible. And if you can do that with enough qubits, you have high quantum volume. So we announced in March that we had hit quantum volume 16. So about half of these machines that we're making available will have quantum volume 16. They will be arranged. So in addition to the 53 that will be available in about a month, uh, we will continue to make 20 qubit machines available. We're adding more five qubit machines. Now that may sound really small, but they are real quantum computers and they have great use in education. We're really doing a lot. We had announcements over the last few weeks about an open source textbook, uh, new videos, uh, all sorts of things. So, so really the, the, the point is we're getting greater and greater demand for more quantum computers, more of what we have, and then to start putting out the new or the latest and greatest. You talked about education, which I think is a huge opportunity. And in mm -hmm. fact, IBM has made quantum computing available to businesses, researchers, and as you pointed out, the academic community through IBM Q Network. Explain exactly how that process works. So through the Q Network, uh, there are different types of members. So there are the members like ExxonMobil, JP Morgan Chase, Samsung, Daimler, BMW. These are the large companies with advanced research programs. So these people are in it for the long run. These are people, for example, Daimler, right? Why would a car company care about quantum computing? Batteries, lithium, air, batteries, right? If I can model the chemical processes of a battery in a quantum computer, I can do that much faster than doing it in a lab. And therefore, they hope to bring these to market much better batteries, much faster. That's one example. Um, another group of members are the hubs, such as Keio University, North Carolina State, Oxford. There are many of them, there are almost 10 of them now. So these are individual centers of excellence around quantum, and they have their own ways of being excellent in some sense. Um, they may do advanced quantum computing research, they may do quantum mechanical research, or in one case, it's Oak Ridge National Lab. This is the same place where we install the Summit supercomputer. Many of the Department of Energy labs in the United States are working with Oak Ridge to use our quantum computers. So we have these centers. They then reach out and they work with, well, in case of Oak Ridge, other government labs, but other companies. In Tokyo, they work with MUFG, the bank. They work with Mitsubishi Chemical, as an example. So it's a way of not having IBM itself necessarily work with all these other people, but we provide the quantum computing capability, such as through this, this new center. We have a whole uh, mix of other companies that just want to work um, with us. Uh, we have the Air Force Research Laboratory, and we have a very active startup program, because really for most startups, they don't want to build a quantum computer, they want to use a quantum computer. And then the universities. So with universities, two reasons, research and education. I mentioned before, we want to get to quantum advantage. We want to have quantum computers being able to solve problems that are valuable. A lot of that comes out of university research. Final point is, is just on the education, which is, you know, if you're in college today, if you're in grad school today, you are going to be hitting the market when there are going to be a lot more jobs that start with the word quantum quantum software engineer. We need to train you now so you're ready when this market really takes off. Makes sense. Tell us about a little bit about at least the 53 qubit quantum computer. What mm -hmm. hurdles did you have to jump to to bring that machine online? You know, um, I've learned a lot about quantum computers. I'm a mathematician by training. I'm not a physicist. I'm not an engineer. All right. So over the last few years, I mean, I've known the theory, I've known the mathematics, but 
understanding how we really build these computers. I, I've, I've learned a lot um, to do this. Um, even going back one level, so the 20 qubit machines, the latest machine we have is a fourth generation architecture. So a lot of people sort of say, well, it's a 20, you know, all 20s look alike and, and whatever. No, in fact, um, as we have been developing the 20 qubit machines, we have been changing the architecture. We've been lay, literally changing the way the qubits are laid out and how they talk to each other. And then all these other factors I mentioned before with quantum volume, which is basically improving the way they work by decreasing the noise either through hardware methods or software methods. So we've been laying the groundwork and, and figuring out the physics and the engineering to make the best twenties so we could then jump. Because as I said with quantum volume, right? Having more qubits which aren't particularly good doesn't get you anywhere. So, um, so that's, that's what the team has been doing. Um, and this, uh, the 53 builds on the layout and the architecture of the latest 20, but we've been able to do it now and will continue to, um, to improve its performance. All right, Bob, what's next for IBM Q? Uh, education, education, education. Um, more people in the IBM Q network. Um, we have a, a really nice pipeline of companies and universities who want to work with us. Um, we're, we're certainly hoping that uh, all these new machines meets the demand. Uh, it's just getting the word out, you know, so let's just put IBM Q on the side for the moment. Let's just talk about quantum computing. It's really different. You know, I mean, this is, you know, I mentioned a quantum software engineer. You could be the great, greatest classical software engineer in the world. That doesn't give you an advantage to being potentially a great quantum software engineer. We want to give people hands-on experience using this. We tried to reduce the friction through the IBM um, Q experience. It's no charge. The software is open source. So if you're a technical person, you think you might be interested in quantum, you know how to code, what's stopping you? <laughs> you That's know, a great question. Here, it's like, here it is. You know, we've got new videos. We've got all these sorts of things. So it's just continue, continued uh, training and education um, while we make better hardware and software. Thanks again. That's Dr. Bob Suter, Vice President of IBM Research for IBM Q Ecosystem Development. Thanks again for joining us, Bob. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to take advantage of this huge opportunity to work with Quantum. What's the best way they can do that? Um, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Robert Sutor. Um, I'm always happy to take questions and uh, answer questions about anything Quantum or anything else. It's always a pleasure having you as a guest. Thanks again. And if you guys Thanks. want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.